All right. So uh, we're going to be pretty quick about this because I have an hour. You have an hour. Um, and uh, I need to get to clinic and so do you guys. But uh, I'm going to give you, if there are any questions, if there are any um, uh, pictures and stuff that I want you guys to interpret, then I'll give you about three seconds before I take over. So uh, the purpose of this lecture is not to uh, uh, not to make you guys struggle. But anyway, so uh, I want this work. Okay, here we go. So uh, it's the first few things that they do ask in the OCAPS is you know about the basic immunology of the eye. Uh, just remember a few things that there are two blood ocular barriers. There's the tight junctions in the blood vessels in the anterior chamber and also uh, in the retina, but there's also tight junctions in the R, uh, between the RPE cells and those are the uh, those comprise the blood ocular barrier. Remember there's a concept of immune privilege, which is partially mediated by the fact that there is a blood ocular barrier, but also med uh, mediated by the fact that there are suppressor T cells uh, such as TH17 cells, um, uh, which mediate this immune privilege or so-called immune privilege. Uh, one common question for some reason is uh, where is antigen in the anterior chamber process by macrophages? This is a uh, concept that stems back to uh, experimental uveitis uh, in, in mice. Um, antigen is pro uh, processed by macrophages in the iris that leave the, uh, the eye through the trabecular meshwork and pre present to the reticular endothelial system. Um, anterior uveitis, what is the most common cause of vision loss? Remember that that is macular edema. Uh, what are the causes of reversible vision loss? Uh, the most common is cataract. Uh, Abigail, what's going on here? Top picture. Um, so I think we're looking at an x-ray of a heel mm -hmm. and there's a fracture there. So that's like anterior to the calcaneus, I think, but. No, uh, there's actually, if you can see my mouse, there's fusion of the, uh, of the, uh, the calcaneal joint here and there's a calcaneal spur and there is uh, kind of this lichenification of the posterior aspect of the calcaneus. You see this spur over here. And this is actually a process, uh, something called uh, enthesitis uh, and axial arthritis that you see in HLA-B27 associated uveitis. So for, uh, they like to give you, you know, little twists. So rather than showing you a, a spine, they, they can show you a heel. And just remember that uh, the, the heel and the Achilles tendon insertion and the, um, the the, uh, the the calcaneus can uh, they can all be uh, inflamed in HLA-B27 disease. So remember that overall worldwide, less than five percent of the population is HLA-B27 positive. Seven to eleven percent of Caucasians, eighteen to thirty-two percent of all anterior uveitis in Western countries, less so elsewhere. Uh, Fifty percent of patients with non-granulomatous anterior uveitis are HLA-B27 positive, so recurrent disease you're talking about. Uh, it's associated with seronegative spondyloarthropathies. 50% uh, uh, of patients with acute um, non-granulomatous anterior uveitis will develop seronegative spondylopathy. But on the converse, 25% of patients who are HLA-B27 positive and have uh, seronegative spondyloarthropathy will develop uh, non-granulomatous anterior uveitis. So those numbers are important. It's four syndromes to know when it comes to HLA-B27 positivity. No ankylosing spondylitis, uh, no riders, now known as inflammatory arthritis. Uh, it, certain aspects of inflammatory bowel disease can in fact uh, uh, have HLA-B27 positive. Um, anterior uveitis, know that uveitis in an isolated fashion with inflammatory bowel disease is likely to be HLA-B27 positive, but scleritis, anterior uveitis, anterior scleritis and scleroveitis uh, are not associated with HLA-B27 
positivity in the setting of inflammatory bowel disease. Does that make sense? Um, and then of course there's psoriatic arthritis, which tends to be HLA B27 positive. Uh, so this is kind of the more conventional picture that they'll show for uh, uh, spondyloarthropathies. Specifically, there's no ankylosis per se, but uh, focus here. Does everybody see my mouse? Yeah. Um, but can you guys see this sclerosis along the sacroiliac joint? See how there's um, uh, kind of this uh, radio opacity uh, along the, the, the joint line and also narrowing of the joint space. So this is sacroiliitis, which is something that you can see most commonly in HLA-B27 disease. Um, but more, of course, you know, in, in, in this is from your BCSC textbook, but um, kind of more unmanaged, you see less and less of this now, but more man, unmanaged ankylosing spondylitis, you can see sclerosis along the joint lines, complete fusion of the vertebra, complete fusion of the sacroiliac joint and this uh, stooped posture, which you don't tend to see anymore, uh, at least in the developed world because it's treated. Um, there is sclerosis and narrowing of the joint spaces. 90% of patients with AS are HLA B27 positive. Um, my guess is that a lot of these Negative HLA-B27 negative patients are actually false negatives, but there's your, there's your statistic. 25% um, will get recurrent anterior non-granulomatous anterior uveitis. Um, so remember that that is the majority of patients with HLA-B27 disease. Of course, in the minority, you can get chronic disease. About 3% of patients with HLA-B27 positive uh, anterior UVA is actually a chronic anterior UVA is, and those patients are more likely to get intermediate UVA is. Remember also, this is another question they'll ask you on your boards, 5% will get aortitis and valvular insufficiency or pulmonary fibrosis. So uh, remember that uh, they can ask you about cardiac manifestations and manifestations of disease that can kill you. Uh, remember also what inflammatory bat pattern back pain is, is the stiffness off the back uh, that lasts for at least 45 minutes after um, uh, after the cessation of sleep, after waking up. Um, but of course, it can also apply to patients who go on long car rides, etc. cetera. Um, who can tell me what the top picture is? It's a foot, it's two feet. Anybody? Ker Keratoderma blenerogium. Bler I can't pronounce it correctly. Ble <laughs> uh, so this is, uh, okay, yeah, this is Keratoderma blenerogicum. And this is, you can see a calcaneal spur in conjunction with enthesitis, which can manifest as calcification of the uh, Achilles tendon, but more commonly just sclerosis along the insertion of the Achilles tendon with a, with a spur. What disease do you think this might be? Reactive arthritis. That's right. So reactive arthritis. Uh, arthritis. Just to remember the can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree. So arthritis, uh, uh, uveitis, and or conjunctivitis and urethritis. Uh, knees, ankles, feet, and hands. Calcaneal spur formation. This remember this one. This buzzword: keratoderma blenerogicum. Uh, which is a desquamating rash of the soles, which can also be seen in syphilis. Exactly. Um, it's not called the same, but it looks very similar. Um, most common eye manifestation is actually not uveitis, it's conjunctivitis. So remember that. 90% of patients with uh, writers are HLA B27 positive, mostly male. And this is another thing they love to ask is which bacteria can it be associated with? Chlamydia, Salmonella, Shigella, Ureplasma, Urolyticum, and Yersinia. Uh, not pestis, but uh, uh, Entercolytica. So basically, just think of the um, of some of the sexually transmitted diseases, but most commonly, actually, it's these uh, these, these bowel pathogens. What is this lesion, Tony? Wake up, Tony. Never mind. Anybody? Yeah. 
Actually, I'm not sure. Pyoderma. Pyoderma. Gangrenosum. That's right. So pyoderma gangrenosum. Is this painful? Looks painful. Generally not. So this is a painless, very, very geographic, bunched out through the dermis uh, skin lesion, usually in the extensive surfaces of the arm or the leg. Uh, this is seen in inflammatory bowel disease, uh, ulcerative colitis, 5 to 10%, Crohn's disease, 2%. Do ask about GI symptoms if you see that. Remember that uh, Crohn's disease affects the entire uh, GI tract, so it can affect the mouth, the uh, the entire mucosa from you know uh, from the lips all the way down to uh, rectum and anus. Uh, so you, you know you get skin lesions, um, pyoderma gangrenosum, aphthous ulcers, which are also pain, painless, um, uh, IBD, and anterior uveitis, as I mentioned before, uh, HLA B27 positive. But if there's inflammatory bowel disease. And scleroyuveitis or anterior scleritis, it's generally not HLA-B27 disease. Of course, there is a spectrum. What do you see here? Name the disease, Cole. Uh, sausage fingers. Yes. <laughs> so dactylitis of uh, like psoriatic right. so, arthritis. So yeah. that, uh, and you also see nail pitting and, 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 and destruction of the nail, the dactylitis. Exactly. Um, but uh, this is a patient with psoriatic arthritis. Remember that psoriatic arthritis, but not psoriasis per se, are related to anterior uveitis. So uh, you have to have the arthritis component. So it's a symmetrical polyarthritis. Uh, there's uh, asymmetric oligoarthritis, uh, this DIP joint in in involvement. There is resorption of the phalanges. So you have shortening of the fingers uh, and lysis of the nails as axial arthritis as well. So you can see neck and thoracic spine and lumbar spine and ankle arthritis as onycholysis, the nail pitting and the sauces disease, the dactylitis and enthesitis as well, which is once again, uh, inflammation of the insertion of Achilles tendon. And that these are just some findings. You can see the dactylitis here the nail pitting, the sauces digits, and the onycholysis. Um, who is R? I don't know. Let's see. Tyler, what do you see here? Uh, so it looks like he has some, I don't know if that's band care top of the ear fiber formation on my phone. Mm -hmm. So there is band. Joints. So I would think about JIA. That's right, so GIA specifically, that's exactly right, Tyler, but uh, if you look at the conjunctive, most people you see on call who have anterior uveitis have red, painful eyes. This is a quiet anterior uveitis. So the, the conjunctiva is white and quiet, but you see evidence of a lot of inflammation. So there's cataract and synechia and band keratopathy, and you'd think this eye would be exquisitely painful, but it's not. Uh, this is, uh, exactly, this is GIA. It's the most common cause of childhood uveitis. Chronic cyclitis occurs in 10 to 20% of all patients with JIA. It's chronic, bilateral, smoldering, and asymptomatic until complications occur. So you, once you do get angle closure or you know, synechial uh, uh, glaucoma, uh, then of course it does hurt. If, if band starts to erode or the eye starts to get dicicle, then it hurts. But before then, in its earlier phase, it's not painful. Um, loss of vision due to band keratopathy, posturesynechia, CME, hypotony is a very common and unfortunately quite devastating complication in cataract. Cataract can be more serious here than in other uveitis because it occurs in an amblyogenic age group. Um, just remember the highest risk of uh, uveitis is female, bossy articular, so oligo articular and ANA positive. But, I would advise you guys to go back and read basically risk stratification in JIA and, and screening guidelines. I haven't gone through it here, but uh, just know that if you have a female young age of onset with three or less joints involved and ANA positive, then you have to see her every two to three months uh, in screening. And then of course, your risk stratification does dictate your screening 
period. So two things that you need to know about in UVI is when it comes to screening, read up uh, JIA screening and read up HIV uh, screening, like which patients with HIV do you screen and how often. Um, I, I won't make you guys suffer through this, but this is uh, inflammatory, it's a vasculitis. You can see kind of a mixed arterial and venous vasculitis. And you can see over here that there's an occlusive vasculitis where there's an area of non-perfusion before the, uh, you know, after temporal to the front of vasculitis. This is actually Bichette's disease. Now, there are two big manifestations in the eye of Bichette's disease. One is an anterior uveitis, which is a hypo, uh, hypopion uveitis. But secondly, don't forget that it also causes kind of a disseminated systemic um, occlusive vasculitis, not just in the eye, but also the brain and the bowel. 25% um, of patients with uh, Bichette's disease have uh, CNS involvement. Do remember also that ischemic necrosis of the bowel is not uncommon. Uh, patients may also have occlusive retinal va vasculitis, panuveitis, and ischemic optic neuropathy as a CNS manifestation. Remember that the Asian variant, but not so much the European variant, sorry, the other way around, the European variant, but not so much the Asian variant of this disease will have HLA-B51 and HLA-B5 association. Um, and of course there is the betatine reaction or pathergy that they can also ask you about in your boards. Um, and you can see here, this is an example of pathergy where uh, a 30 gauge needle was uh, was used to make these this linear pattern of uh, of punctures, and 24 hours later you have these vesic this vesicular eruption at the site of uh, of the puncture, and this is uh, this is a phenomenon known as pathogy, where uh, uh, you get these vesicular uh, eruptions at the site of any skin trauma. And this is a hallmark of Bechet's disease. Sarcoidosis. It's another disease I'd like to question you about. 30 to 60% of patients have eye involvement. What is the most common uh, in, uh, eye involvement in sarcoidosis, Abigail? Asleep. Um, so... <laughs> Most common involvement of uh, in the eyes of sarcoidosis is actually lacrimal gland or dry eye. Um, anterior uveitis is the second most common. Sorry, this was an error in my part. Sorry, this was not supposed to be a trick question. Um, and it's the most common cause of intermediate uveitis. It's the most uh, most common in females, African American origin, and Scandinavians. Um, and in Utah, most of the patients with sarcoidosis you see will have um, Scandinavian origin. Um, this is uh, another slide that they like to show. This is a, uh, like, these are two non caseating granulomas within tissue and also a lot of little lymphocytes everywhere. So uh, very different from the tuberculosis uh, granulomas because they don't have a clear or caseous center. Um, clinical signs suggestive of sarcoidosis. Uh, do you remember the mutton fat keratic precipitates, Kepi's nodules? You can also get uh, inferior, inferiorly kind of situated uh, keratic precipitates that are not granulomatous, although these are less suggestive. You can also see granules uh, or nodules on the anterior surface of the iris, known as Bosaka's nodules. Kepi nodules, as you can see, can evolve into synechia. Other signs of uh, sarcoidosis, you can have uh, macro aneurysms associated with, uh, uh, with inflammation along the blood vessels, optic nerve head granuloma, as you can see here, these little punched out choroidal, uh, retinochoroidal lesions, and also choroidal lesions along the retinal vasculature. Classically, the vasculitis is very venular. Uh, so you see kind of this, uh, this candle wax dripping or tache de Bourget, uh, uh, you know, very vascular infiltrates, um, de denoting very phlebitis in sarcoid. 30% of patients will have lacrimal gland enlargement. 
and 60% will have increased gallium uptake in the, in the lacrimal gland. So it does most commonly affect the lacrimal gland, even in asymptomatic patients. Okay, anybody? Abigail, you there? Um, I would think, sorry, my audio. Um, I would think uh, Fuchs uh, or... Yeah. Yes, right, yeah. so heterochromia, uh, these little periodic precipitates, and what, what, what's going on here? It's really so, hard to see on my small screen. I think that's the T. So that's the trabecular meshwork, but uh, it's the, um, you can see these bridging vessels um, in, in Fuchs disease. And so, you know, commonly when you depressurize the anterior chamber during cataract surgery, uh, one of the things, complications of cataract surgery during Fuchs, uh, in a patient with Fuchs is, is uh, getting a high femur. And uh, uh, because of the rupture of these, these bridging blood vessels. Um, remember, 10% of uh, Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis are bilateral, in which case, of course, they do not have heterochromia. There's iris atrophy, there's fine stellate keratic precipitates with these little connecting legs, minimal cell and flare. Synechia almost never form, and that's an important distinction. Cataract and glaucoma are common. And remember that there are fine vessels that cross the TM on gonioscopy, which makes cataract surgery complicated and can increase your risk. Uh, it's often difficult to treat. So you often have to just tolerate a little bit of uh, cell. And that it makes sense then that it's, there's a possible association with an infectious agent uh, and this has been identified in certain PCR studies to be rubella. So remember, there are many differential diagnoses of heterochromia. Uh, Fuchs is one of them, but then you have to think about neoplastic disease, and siderosis. Herpetic disease can often cause um, a heterochromia, and that can be CMV, HSV, and varicella zoster virus, uh, and of course, congenital horners. Okay, what's going on here? So Asian kid with strawberry tongue and Kawasaki. yeah, so Kawasaki's disease. So uh, where did the upside go? That's weird. Oh, there you go. So it's mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome. The remember mortality is related to coronary artery uh, aneurysm and thrombosis. Avoid steroids, that's one question that they'll ask because that can increase your risk of coronary death. Two thirds have uveitis, 97% bilateral, five days of fever. Conjunctivitis, it spares the limbus, so there's no discharge as well. Strawberry tongue or oral mucosal involvement, there's a rash of the palms and soles, and there's generalized lymphadenopathy. This is one complex that they like to use. Uh, test you for Bosnia Schlossman syndrome, which I don't think really exists, but they'll test you in your boards. Um, so it's bilateral glaucoma, uh, so unilateral glaucoma uh, cyclitis crisis. Uh, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. Always think HSV, VCV, and CMV first. Now, actually, they think having done um, PCR of patients with so-called Bosnia Schlossman syndrome, they've found that it's actually in many cases associated with CMV. My guess is that it's often associated with any of the herpetic viruses. Um, it's associated with a very high IOP, corneal edema, fine KP, very scant cell and flare, and you treat with steroids and glaucoma medicines. Um, often, in fact, if the pressure is not too high, if you just treat day one with steroids only, uh, the, the pressure will come down because it's purely due to uh, trabeculitis. The dif a differential diagnosis of uh, hypertensive uveitis is herpetic. So HSV, VCV, CMV, Fuchs, sarcoid, syphilis, and toxoplasma. Uh, Lebanese friend of mine says his grandmother used to admonish him by saying, psst. Uh, and uh, FSSKT, I don't know if this helps anybody. For some reason, it helped me. But uh, think about Fuchs, syphilis, sarcoid, uh, 
character uveitis and toxoplasma. Uh, all of these uh, can cause a hypertensive anterior uveitis, but most commonly it's herpetic. Um, think, her, uh, think Lebanese grandmas. Um, necrotizing retinitis, acute retinal necrosis, progressive outer retinal necrosis, and CMV retinitis. These are things that you need to know about. Viral retinitis may occur in immunocompromised or immunocompetent patients. Retinal detachment occurs in up to 75% of patients when there has been more than one third involvement of the retina. Um, there are, uh, you'll often have multiple breaks and early, early uh, proliferative vitreo retinopathy, you always need oil um, and the retina tries to crunch even once you have it completely attached. It's a horrible disease. Um, you treat with IV or oral and uh, antivirals and intravitreals. You don't, you cannot treat with intravitreals in isolation. And in fact, the role of intravitreal antivirals is controversial. Uh, except perhaps in porn. Uh, you can treat with oral valacyclovir to obtain IV level uh, IV levels of uh, of uh, acyclovir in the blood. You treat uh, with two grams three times a day rather than the usual one gram three times a day. We can do that for up to a week and it's safe. You can use IV acyclovir, um, which would be 10 milligrams per kilogram, uh, three times a day, so every eight hours. You can get intravitreal acyclovir in Europe. You do not get intravitreal acyclovir in the United States. You can use famcyclovir, IV or oral, although it's harder to reach the appropriate plasma levels with this drug. You can inject uh, gancyclovir. You can do IV intravitreal or vitrocert, which is no longer available, but was uh, manufactured by Bausch & Lohm. I think I implanted the very last one uh, because it was expired by six months and uh, then we had no more. Um, this was in San Francisco. Um, Foscarnet can be IV or intravitreal. The good thing about Foscarnet is that you use it in the same uh, concentration as what you get in the vial, which uh, 2,400 uh, milligrams in 0 0.1 uh, per, per, uh, in 0 0.1 milliliters, so you don't have to recompound it. And of course, you, the only oral um, treatment for, um, uh, so if you want to use uh, if something for CMV, and if you want to get gancyclovir in an oral formulation, you have to use val valgancyclovir. Now, of course, there are three other new antiviral agents that are active against CMV in, in taken orally. One of them is Latomovir, which is approved for peripheral CMV, but not uh, approved for organ-specific CMV, but we have used it and it is, uh, got, has got a much better side effect profile. Remember also that CMV can, uh, can get resistance um, to Gancyclovir and by extension to valgancyclovir, there is a specific uh, uh, viral mutation that you can actually um, sequence for, which I forgot. Um, look it up. Steroids may be added. Laser is controversial for necrotizing retinitis. This is a, oh wait, where did I, Arn, picture go? So yeah, this is Arn. So you can see kind of this rapidly uh, progressive peripheral uh, retinitis, usually multiple foci that starts to um, come together and move centripetally. It's uh, very fast. It moves about a disc diameter or two disc diameters uh, per day. Um, notice also that when you look at the blood vessels and in arm, there is some perivascular apparent clearing. This is not really clearing, it's just um, kind of an absence of necrosis because it's washed away from the uh, cap, uh, through the capillaries around, uh, uh, around the major blood vessels. So you see clearing, although it's not actually clearing, it's, it's, it's just the appearance of perivascular clearing of disease. Uh, this is 
um, the difference between this and the previous picture is simply that you can you have a better view, you have a clearer picture, and that means that there's less vitritis. This is as rapidly progressive, if not more, and it's actually harder to treat. This is progressive outer retinal necrosis, which what is the difference between ARN and PORN? ARN is generally seen in immunocompetent patients and PORN is seen in exclusively in immunocompromised patients. That does not always mean HIV. That can, you can see it in organ transplant patients, bone marrow transplant patients, or even patients that you've locally immunosuppressed. There have actually been reports of patients who get progressive outer retinal necrosis after an Ozurdex injection or, um, or a subketinone scandal log. So local immunosuppression obviously can have the same effect as systemic immunosuppression. Born needs to be treated more aggressively, is treated with, um, uh, with high dose um, plus garnet and gancyclovir in an alternating fashion and uh, treated with IV or very, very high dose. Valtrex in this situation, I prefer IV. So you most commonly, it's varicella zoster, as I said, rapid and relentless progression. It uh, involves the macula early and there is no to little vitritis. Anybody, what's going on here? It's more like CMV retinitis. Right, so this is pretty classic CMV retinitis. So you see kind of this uh, uh, progression along the arcade. How fast does CMV retinitis progress? Not very fast, it's about a disc diameter per week. So even if you saw this, you don't have to panic. Um, obviously this one is very close to the macula, so you, maybe you should plan it, but, and you should treat this with intravitreals, but if you see peripheral CMV retinitis, you don't have to treat with intravitreals or, or go to IVs immediately. Um, in the HIV era, uh, you would often treat, um, you know, peripheral CMV, um, with careful observation and, 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 and just trying to get patients under control with antivirals uh, and treat the immunosuppression first um, and then start treating the eye with intravitreal gancyclovir once it starts to show evidence of progression. That's how slow it is. But equally devastating because it's hard to um, stop. At least not as devastating now that we have good treatments for HIV. But uh, with CMV, you can see kind of peripheral vascular occlusion and occlusive vasculitis is actually very common in these patients. With uh, I've had I have patients with arm to artery time of about a minute with CMV retinitis. Um, so immunocompromised patients, not just HIV, CD4 counts of less than 50, uh, retinitis with hemorrhage, all the ret layers of the retina tend to be affected in a granular fashion in the periphery. It usually starts along the arcades but can occur anywhere. And there's a segmental vasculitis that's occlusive. What's this? This is HIV retinopathy. You can see multiple cotton wool spots. It looks a lot like diabetic retinopathy, a kind of a hybrid of diabetic and hypertensive retinopathy. This is a microvascular disease that induced um, uh, by immune complex disease in patients with uh, HIV. It is not an infectious retinitis. So remember that it does not, it just means that the patient has uncontrolled or poorly controlled HIV. So it's a microvascular retinopathy along the arcade, not infectious, it's gotten wool spots and hemorrhages. It resembles very much interferon retinopathy. Uh, it was, that's an entity that you will see um, less and less off because we're using less and less interferon in the treatment of hepatitis, but uh, it does resolve with uh, heart. What's this? Toxo. Yeah, exactly. So you have retinochoroiditis uh, adjacent to a scar um, with, usually there's overlying vitritis, which it's unusual to see such a clear picture, but yeah, this is toxoplasma. Uh, 
Remember that it's an obligate intracellular parasite. The cat, cat is the definitive host. Uh, I don't know if anybody read the Nature article, but it actually makes mice less afraid of cats as an evolutionary adaptation where a toxoplasma infected mouse will be unafraid of a cat and then go up to the cat, get eaten and perpetuate the life cycle of toxoplasma, which I thought was pretty cool. You can also get it and most commonly you get it from undercooked meat, um, uh, soil and cat poop. Cat poop, as you can see, is number three. Uh, in, in Brazil, the most common, which is the place with the highest incidence of toxoplasma, uh, the main culprit is undercooked meat. Remember that the bradyzoite is the latent cyst and the tachyzoite is the, uh, is, is the uh, phase of the organism that causes retinochoroiditis. Remember that there's a white yellow lesion with vitritis overlying it. Active lesions occur at the edge of old scars. In utero infection is as common as acquired infection. And if you have a patient with de novo toxoplasma, as in not associated with a scar, uh, uh, think about HIV. Uh, and if a patient is HIV positive and has toxoplasma in the eye, always obtain a CT of the um, of the brain because you'll see these ring enhancing lesions. Treatment options do include triple therapy, pyrimethamine, sulfonamide, pyrimethamine, azithromycin, trovacone, and prednisone after 24 hours. This is a, a, an example of, uh, uh, of toxicara, which is an inter intestinal parasite. So remember, if they ask you what it is, it's a nematode. So this is a uh, this is a larval form, encysted larval form of a nematode. Uh, children, young adults, usually unilateral, it is one cause of leukocoria, but when the cyst does uh, erupt, there is uh, the endophthalmitis phase. It's usually a peripheral granuloma. Uh, you can treat with albendazole and the steroid. You can actually re resect the cyst as well, but do that with caution. White dot syndromes. This is something they love to ask about. Here's a 67 year old with nyctalopia and botrytis. This is birdshot. You can see some of these bisiform lesions, which uh, you can actually enumerate better with uh, ICG angiography. Uh, more than patients tend to be greater than 40 years of age, median age is 57. This blurring of vision, loss of color vision, nyctalopia, contrast sen sen sensitivity problems. Vitritis, vascular attenuation, late disc edema is actually a fairly common presentation. CME and significant risk of CNVM. Not as high as PIC or multifocal choroiditis, or, but still exists between 50 and 30%. Multiple cream color radially oriented lesions in the post equatorial fundus. And then remember, of course, the HLA 29 association, which is actually one of two HLA. Uh, associations that I ever look for in my clinic because uh, if a patient is HLA-A29 negative, I rethink my diagnosis of birdshot. What is this? Which is Ali here? Serpiginous. That's right. So uh, Ali and I were seeing a patient that we were suspicious for um, uh, serpiginous in, and and uh, it was actually just AMD, but this is this is a this is a patient with true serpiginous, and you can see that there's this blurring of this area here over the fovea, and then the the macula is obliterated in this situation, and it's usually older patients over forty geographic pattern it used to be called helicoid uh, retinal atrophy. Um, it's most common in um, Sorry, it, it's most commonly peripapillary, but it can in, in about 10% start in the macula. And then it can also start in a multifocal fashion, in which case it's called ampiginous or relentless placoid. Uh, block early, stain late, like most inflammatory choroidopathies, uh, there's a transmission defect. It's progressive with multiple crops of, uh, of, of recurrence. 
and it can often result in CNBM up to 40%. It often needs treatment with alkylating agents, although I'm more likely to go to um, rituximab now before I do an alkylating agent. And geography, this is actually a really good distinguishing test. But number, if you look on the left side of the slide, you can see that there's this early blockage with late staining. And so this was the area that I was pointing out to you uh, that stains late and it's um, you know central macular progression. And then in the other on the other side, you don't see so much of this early blockage in their staining because it's less active. But one way to differentiate this from other geographic forms of uh, of uh, retinal or geographic retinal disease such as GA and AMD is in the mid phases of the uh, mid and late phases of the angiogram. You see this kind of brush fire type staining at the edge of the of the lesion. This does not imply involve uh, actually this, this does not imply um, activity. Um, MUDES, another disease they like to ask about young to middle-aged women, 90%, 90% unilateral, but remember it can also be 10% bilateral. You see granular or punctate changes in the macula. Uh, if you look really closely, the spots are small, about 10, uh, 100 to 200 microns, so about the size of a uh, uh, between the size of an artery and a vein, leaving the optic nerve. Um, there's wreaths like staining, and this has always confused me. Is it the whole thing? Is it, 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 it the entire distribution of the spots that are wreaths, or is it the spots themselves that are wreaths? Turns out that the wreath like staining is actually those little uh, spots in the uh, themselves. They have this little wreath like pattern you'll see an enlarged blind spot. And if you do a multifocal ERG or in the peripapillary zone, you'll see why there's an enlarged blind spot. You see uh, obliteration of ERG amplitudes along uh, in the peripapillary zone. Um, so, and, so angiographically, you can see these little wreath-like spots, these little dots kind of arranged in these little wreaths. Um, ICG will show you more um, numerous um, lesions, but once again, you can see punctate hyperfluorescence and staining uh, late of the, these lesions and of the optic nerve. Sometimes you get a little bit of vitritis and a little bit of discodema as well. The rate of recurrence of mutes is 10%, just remember that. Uh, this is a case of very classic AMPI, so APMAPAPI. Uh, acute placoid multifocal pigment epitheliopathy, uh, posterior pigment epitheliopathy, acute posterior multifocal placoid pigment epitheliopathy. Yeah. Um, so this is uh, a, has a viral prodrome most commonly, it's usually young adults, cream colored plaques, approximately one disc diameter is much larger, much, much larger than what you see in mutes to the they disappear over several weeks. The FA will remain abnormal, usually bilateral. Most do well, but many end up with a little bit of scarring. I tend to treat with steroids, but um, as far as your OCAPs are concerned, you can just say that it's a self-limiting disease. Um, yeah, and just also remember that a lot of these patients have, uh, have headache. And if you do have patients with headache, always do at, le at the very least an MRA, MRV, because about um, five to 10% in literature of patients with AMPI uh, um, uh, do have ret um, cerebrovasculitis as well. And I've seen, uh, you know, fleeting cases of cerebrovasculitis in AMPI, and, but I've also seen uh, bilateral pontine infarcts in uh, amphigenous. So it's, it's important to screen for, um, uh, for cerebrovasculitis. This is a case of PIC or punctate intercoridopathy where you see these little spots, most classically in the macula, but you can have extra macular spots. The difference between PIC and multifocal choroiditis is that PIC does not have uh, vitritis. Uh, 
that was the dogma. However, it's 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 more now recognized to be a spectrum between PIC and multifocal choroiditis, where you do in fact see a little bit of posterior vitreous cell. Um, if you were to do swept source imaging uh, or, or OCT of the uh, premacular vitreous. This is a case of multifocal choroiditis where you can see more vitritis, disc edema, kind of a more blood and thunder type appearance. Um, uh, and, and more with the pan UVI just can, uh, kind of appearance rather than PIC, which is more quiet looking. So remember in multifocal versus PIC, there's vitritis versus no vitritis, the lesions are smaller in PIC, whereas in multifocal choroiditis, they're up to 200 microns. Um, the, uh, the course is chronic in, in multifocal choroiditis and you often, the majority of patients will need immunomodulatory therapy, whereas in PIC, needing immunomodulatory therapy is the exception, not the rule. It's, it's self-limited uh, and the most common manifestation of PIC is uh, CNVM. Syphilis, this is something we're seeing more and more of in our clinics. Uh, it's, uh, you remember there's a difference between congenital and secondary syphilis. Congenital syphilis usually presents with, it can present with uveitis, but most commonly presents with interstitial keratitis and uh, peripheral congenital looking retinopathy. Uh, and deafness and all that stuff. Uh, secondary syphilis will present with rash and arthritis, iritis, retinitis, choroiditis, basically it can do anything. Uh, in testing, previously you would do a treponemal and non-treponemal test. So you do an FDA and an RPR, or you do an MHATP and a VRDL. But now uh, we tend to do something called reverse sequence testing. This is that will not be tested in your OCAPs because it's very new. But in reverse sequence testing, uh, you start with uh, IgG testing um, in the blood. And if that is positive, then you go on to do your treponemal and non-treponemal test. That's a pretty good way of going about it. If the patient has UVAs, you always need to do a lumbar puncture to rule out neurosyphilis. Um, and despite what some of your ID friends may say, all patients with syphilitic uveitis need to be treated as if it is neurosyphilis. So CDC guidelines are to do a lumbar puncture at day zero before treatment and then in six months to, uh, to check for C, uh, CSF VDRL. Uh, you can use penicillin G, IV, or IM uh, for for uh, for two weeks, but you have to make sure that you use IV if um, there is neurosyphilis. Lyme is also a spirochete related to uh, at least morphologically and in size to syphilis. Um, you remember that they always ask you the name of the tick. It's Ixodes or the deer tick. Uh, it also has stages very similar to uh, syphilis, where there's a primary stage one month after infection with uh, erythema chronicum migrans and follicular conjunctivitis. Um, stage two, one to four months after infection with neurocardiac abnormalities and arthritis. Uh, and in this stage, you start to get ocular involvement with iritis, keratitis, and intermediate uveitis. Stage three, chronic arthritis, meningitis, and keratitis, and you treat with tetracycline or IV ceftriaxone if CNS involvement is um, present. Uh, over here in the West, people laugh about it, Lyme diagnosis, and that's true because your pretest probability is very, very low um, because it's not uh, transmitted here. However, we had several cases of Lyme keratitis and Lyme uveitis in, um, in, in Long Island, New York. So if you end up practicing out east, then doing a test for Lyme is, is not foolish. But if you are practicing out west, doing a test for Lyme is not particularly a good idea because you get false positives. Sympathetic ophthalmia, you get bilateral granulomatous pan-uveitis. Remember, it is bilateral. So even if you were to take the 
a, of course, you don't really look at the inciting eye because it's often tricycle or, or there's no view. But if you were to take this eye out and do, <clears throat> uh, do a pathological examination of this eye, just remember that it is still a bilateral disease. It happens two to 50 weeks or longer after injury to the inciting eye. There's diffuse granulomatous choroidal inflammation that's bilateral exudative RD. Um, previously, they would say that it spares the choriocapillaris. Sympathetic is sympathetic to the choriocapillaris. This is not true. This is a histological artifact. It does, in fact, involve the choriocapillaris. But uh, depending on how your OCAP question is asked, sometimes you do have to give false information. Remember, the Dallin's fuke nodule is a pathological uh, lesion. Uh, there was some controversy about whether or not you should enucleate the inciting eye before one to two weeks have evolved, but that becomes moot for two reasons. Number one, we can treat sympathetic ophthalmia really well with, um, with immunomodulation. And secondly, um, now the in, number one inciting factor is actually surgery, especially vitreoretinal surgery. So you wouldn't be able to think about removing the inciting eye when the inciting event is surgery. So not really relevant to do that anymore. It's not an eye, it's an eye, God. Um, so this is an example of sympathetic ophthalmia, granulomatous and uh, panuveitis with an exudative retinal detachment. You can see that this is you know, somewhat multi-lobulated. And if you were to turn the patient to the side, this retinal detachment would shift. So uh, kind of a hallmark of, of uh, exudative retinitis or exudative retinal detachment. This is what a Dallin's Fuchs nodule looks like under the RPE and at the level of the chorea capillaris um, with overlying elevation of the outer retina. BKH is basically just sympathetic ophthalmia without trauma. That's all it is. It's a histologically indistinguishable uh, disease. However, there are uh, systemic manifestations, just chronic diffuse bilateral granulomatous uveitis, exudative RD, uh, no prior history of trauma, and it's in certain populations such as uh, indigenous American populations, the Inuit and in Japan, but I've seen it in India, Pakistan, and Iran as well, and in, in, in the, the Middle Eastern or Saudi populations as well. So remember this vitiligo, poliosis. Poliosis is uh, uh, whitening of eyelashes. You'll have headache, meningismus, loss of consciousness, paralysis, deafness, and tinnitus. Those are the main neurological manifestations. Know also that interestingly, you can see these manifestations also in sympathetic. I've had patients with sympathetic with hearing loss and ringing in their ears and whatnot. Um, but here's an example. So you see this multi-lobe neurosensory RD uh, with kind of these corrugations and disc hyperemia. Um, the angiogram is very telling. There's the kind of this, uh, this punctate hyperfluorescence that then pools uh, into the subretinal space, given this initial starry sky pattern followed by this pooling everywhere. You can see a good example of pooling here. Uh, this is, and uh, moving on, this, this is, these are examples of intraocular lymphoma where you see atypical vitreous cells. In sheets, you see um, kind of a, uh, an iris and ciliary body mass um, uh, in a patient with B cell lymphoma. See how the mass is pushing the IOL backwards. Uh, and, and then you see this patient who was sent in as ARN, who I looked at and said, this does not look like ARN. This was actually lymphoma as well. One reason you can tell is that the, there's these different ages of lesions. Um, which you don't see so much in ARN. Uh, so lar large B-cell lymphoma is, is the most common presentation in the eye. It may be primary ocular or CNS. Bilateral is more likely to be CNS. Um, you, if you see unusual cells and clumps, think about lymphoma. If it's 
partially responsive to steroids. Uh, think about uh, lymphoma, but you know, even lymphoma can respond partially to steroids because there is some uh, very cellular inflammation, something called desmoplasia. So treat with intravitreal rituximab and methotrexate if ocular only, but if it's bilateral, do consider systemic treatment. In fact, a lot of centers do that for bilateral disease without CNS involvement. Choroidal lymphoma is a different animal. Remember, small B-cell lymphoma, not large B-cell lymphoma. CNS involvement is almost unheard of. Systemic involvement at presentation is common. So you see this retroperitoneal or, um, or hyler or mediastinal involvement without CNS involvement. But ongoing screening is not often necessary because if there is no systemic involvement at presentation, that tends not to be uh, future systemic um, involvement. This is a patient with, uh, you can see this tiny hypopion and some exudate along the IOL. This is a chronic endophthalmitis. Uh, B acnes, can, but can also be others. I've seen clostridium, I've seen uh, corine bacterial. Uh, I've even seen strep chronic endophthalmitis, which was weird. Uh, but you can get inflammation in the eyes up to two years after any kind of surgery. You'll see AC cell, keratic precipitates, and a small hypopion. You see plaques on the intraocular lens, vitritis. And actually, sometimes when you see these plaques on the IOL and you do a YAG, you can actually liberate these organisms into the vitreous, precipitating an attack of uh, P. acne's endophthalmitis. So always think of endophthalmitis when the patient has a history of surgery. And also, uh, I'm going to give you guys this presentation to look at, but these are all the various HLA associations. And, and I don't know about you guys right now, but back in my day, the OCAPs would love to ask about HLA associations, which are totally useless, except for HLA-B27, and HLA-A29, uh, that's the only two HLA associations that in practice you know about, but unfortunately for your OCAPs, it's nice to know some of these others just because they love to ask. And that's it, any questions? Mm -hmm.